When asked his opinion on the great civilization to the east, Napoleon of France is rumoured to have replied, La Chine est un géant qui sommeille, là c'est le dormir, car lorsqu'il s'éveillera, le monde entier tremblera. And I like to think of Old Boney as setting the stage for an academic debate on the Middle Kingdom that's been with us for centuries, but began to gather real steam about 20 years ago. In one corner, we have scholars like Martin Jack, who writes in When China Rules the World, that Western decline is inevitable, and Beijing's rise will not only shape global economics, but global politics and ideology. On this view, liberal democracies like the United States face real challenges in the decades to come, and any sensible government would think carefully about how to manage them. Whereas in the opposite corner, researchers like Ho Hung of Johns Hopkins argue that China's internal difficulties, ranging from corruption to the environment and demographics, will prevent her from dominating Asia let alone anywhere else, and Washington hawks are being paranoid as usual. Now that the free world is under new management, I've been trying to work out which side President Biden takes in all of this, but I have to say, he's not making it easy for me. China is going to eat our lunch? Come on, man. They can't even figure out how to deal with the, 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 the fact that they have this great division between the China Sea and the mountains in the east, I mean in the west. They can't figure out how they're going to deal with the corruption that exists within the system. I mean, I, you know, they're not bad folks, folks, but guess what? They're not a they're, they're not, not, they're competition for us. So this statement aligns very much with the second perspective, right? And I would anticipate no foreign policy particulars on that basis. After all, if China isn't competition and poses little risk to American interests, why waste time worrying? That seems fairly straightforward. We'll also take on directly the challenges posed by our prosperity, security, and democratic values by our most serious competitor, China. We'll confront China's economic abuses, counter its aggressive, coercive action to push back on China's attack on human rights, intellectual property, and global governance. I'm confused. Yeah, and this is precisely why the English lexicon developed phrases like actions speak louder than words, and by his deeds shall ye know him. So, with that in mind, here are some points on the graph. Firstly, since entering the White House, Joe Biden has signed over 30 executive orders, making good on his promise to roll back major policy decisions taken by the previous president. America has rejoined the Paris Climate Accord, killed the Keystone Pipeline, and yet, Trump's agenda on China remains largely intact. Now, it's true that prohibitions on some tech platforms like TikTok and, and WeChat have been reversed pending investigation, but the tariffs remain, the sanctions remain, and the delisting of various stocks with suspected ties to the CCP and its military is going ahead. Secondly, Taiwan, famously pro-Trump, following his decision to strengthen relations via an increase in weapon sales and official recognition of their efforts to warn the world about coronavirus, Biden is doubling down. He not only invited Taipei's de facto ambassador to his inauguration, a move unprecedented since 1979, but when Xi Jinping flew 15 fighter jets over Taiwanese airspace in January, the American Navy sent a guided missile destroyer through the Taiwan Strait. And finally, a man is judged by the company he keeps, and given that the Biden administration is in its infancy, yet to announce a detailed policy on China, who are the individuals Grandpa Joe has appointed to formulate this policy. Well, 
when it comes to the Far East, the three people set to have the greatest influence are Secretary of State Antony Blinken, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, and Asia Coordinator Kurt Campbell. So the question is, what are they saying? And can we make any predictions as to the direction of travel on that basis? Over to you, Secretary of State. Uh, there's been a, a strong and long bipartisan <coughs> commitment uh, to Taiwan, uh, the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, also the communiques uh, with China. And part of that commitment is making sure that um, Taiwan have the uh, ability um, to defend itself uh, against aggression. Uh, and that is a commitment that will uh, absolutely endure uh, in, a, uh, in a Biden administration. I also believe that um, uh, President Trump was right in taking uh, a tougher approach to China. Uh, I disagree very much with uh, the way that he went about it in a number of areas, but the basic principle was the right one, and I think that's actually helpful. As we look at uh, China, there is no doubt that it poses the most significant challenge of any nation state uh, to the United States in terms of our uh, interests, the interests of the American people. Um, there are, as I see it, rising adversarial aspects to the relationship, certainly competitive ones, and still some cooperative ones when it is in uh, our mutual interest. Okay, so we heard some positive reassurances vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, acknowledgement that Trump's instincts were right in this area, and a commitment to make China the centerpiece of US foreign policy. Uh, since then, Blinken has publicly sided with Mike Pompeo in labeling the treatment of uh, Xinjiang's Muslim population a genocide, and suggested mimicking the British offer of citizenship to those facing internal repression on the island of Hong Kong. Is it possible that bipartisan agreement is emerging here? Yeah, it's, it's really remarkable. So basically what's happened is Republicans and Democrats, policymakers and politicians alike, have essentially all concluded in the last three years, very, very rapidly and very recently, we totally screwed up. We got China all wrong. We had these bets that if we integrated them into the world economy, they'd become more politically liberal over time that if we brought them into our rules-based order, that they would become a responsible stakeholder, as you said, and that their interest in stability would lead them to act in less aggressive ways. And these bets didn't pay off, and now they're big and powerful, and they took advantage of us, and we have a closing window of opportunity to do something about it. So by golly, we got to do something. And it's no longer about cooperation, now it's about competition. And competition, in a way, is kind of a code word for confrontation. That, I think, is like essentially where the body language of the Democratic and Republican national security establishment is right now. You know, I think it's fair to say that the Trump administration may have succeeded in cementing the most significant foreign policy pivot since September of 2001. And look, there's no doubt that Republicans and Democrats will disagree about how to meet the challenges presented by Beijing in the years to come, but that they will prioritize them seems to be a matter of consensus. The giant's roar has shaken the United States out of bed, and now she's wondering what to do next. Which leads me on to the final member of our team, Kurt Campbell, who fills the newly created role of Asia Coordinator. This man will devise Joe Biden's strategy on China. So it's rather helpful that he gave a talk to Foreign Policy UK last year, spelling out a seven-point plan for such an occasion. A seven-point plan which I'm going to, as they say, share with you. So the first element that I think you're going to hear a lot of going forward is the idea of American domestic investment. And this is a this is a, it's not a trick, but it is an approach that Democrats have often made when it comes to foreign policy. The key issue will be the idea that the real areas of competition with China are not military. Military is important, 
but ultimately it will be in leading technology areas, AI, 5G, robotics, quantum computing, and those areas require substantial investments in R&D, public-private partnerships, education, areas where the United States has frankly fallen down and not made the kinds of investments, uh, frankly, since the Cold War. Okay, so obviously, Democrats gonna Democrat. Uh, there will never be a problem for which the solution in the eyes of these people is not to chuck tax dollars at it. Give me your fucking money! <laughs> but look, is it true that technology will ultimately determine supreme power in the universe? Yes. And China is behind the US at the moment, but they're catching up. So I can actually see the point of a Manhattan-style project on AI, quantum mechanics, and, and all the rest of it. Execution is everything, of course. You want to assist the private sector, not control the private sector. Google employs 50% of the world's best computer scientists. Just let them get on with it. All right, Washington can help with incentives. So increase scholarships for students with an aptitude for STEM. Okay, are we giving green cards to foreign Ivy League graduates so they can work at IBM in California instead of Alibaba in Hangzhou? And the other factor here is security. What export controls? are in place right now to prevent the sale of advanced chips to CCP affiliated companies. Are there any? I mean, these are the sorts of things the Biden administration should be thinking about. The second is, is a longer term uh, effort, but one that I think cannot be underestimated. And I would call this basically capacity building. So at the same time that we have focused so much on Iraq and Afghanistan, we have focused our uh, capabilities inside the US government and in our military and our intelligence on building a cadre of people that understand local traditions and history and the Middle East. I would, I would uh, posit that we have not made the same kinds of investments in our government. And let me also say in our business is to really understand the nature of the challenges and opportunities of Asia. Right, and you're going to see a major shift in emphasis from the Middle East to the Indo-Pacific over the next 10 years, whether it's diplomatic capacity, language and cultural training, to deepen ties with the Japanese, the Koreans and the Australians, language skills will be particularly important for that last one. What's that? Nothing, Uncle Brian. But also military capacity. I would expect less investment in conventional troops and more in Navy and Air Force technology. You're essentially moving from the desert to the South China Sea, where an entirely different set of operational challenges await, which is one of the reasons, by the way, Joe Biden is not going to start a war in the Middle East. I know there's a lot of fuss about that, but short of Iran invading Israel or something, not only is there zero political will for regime change anymore, there's also no time for it. If there is going to be a war in the next five years, it'll be instigated by China over Taiwan. Now, I'm not predicting that, I think that's unlikely, but this is where the momentum is today. The history of the 21st century will be written in Asia, and America is running out of room, frankly, to prepare for that in just about every important way. The third element that you're going to hear a lot about going forward is allies and friends. And it's an easy throwaway line. It's not meant to be throwaway, but the idea that we're going to listen more and work more closely with allies and friends. And I think in many respects, this is meant as a contrast with the Trump administration. And I think, I think just as I tried to compliment the Trump administration on successfully and effectively diagnosing some challenges 
that China presented. I think they have tried to go it alone way too much and they have not worked as effectively with a broader coalition of countries. They have done some in the quad and some bilaterally, but I think overall much more needs to be done in terms of allied and friendly engagement. This is critical and I've said it before, the days of America being able to unilaterally contain, bully, or even influence China, really, if they ever existed, are over. China is far too big, far too rich, far too connected. If you want international engagement on America's terms, you're going to have to work with people. The real questions, of course, are how you do that and how hard you're prepared to work. But it's going to turn out as someone I've worked in the Pentagon, the State Department, elsewhere, I've worked a lot on allied engagement. It is challenging and it's much harder than we realize. And there are a number of things that will be difficult right from the outset. The first is that as we listen to allies, it's going to turn out that many of them are going to say, let's have a trade strategy. Let's have an effective, outward, optimistic trade strategy. And right now, the position formally, if you will, of both political parties in the United States is ambiguous about trade. So we're going to have to think that through and understand that our ticket to the big game might be our military capability, but countries are looking for more. They want an open, optimistic trade framework, standard setting in which the United States engages. Exactly. And Xi Jinping has just emerged as the region's leading spokesman for free trade. I mean, I'm pulling my hair out here. You cannot afford to make countries choose, particularly emerging markets, between a military relationship with the United States and an economic relationship with the Chinese Communist Party. You are fucked if you do that. You will not like the decision they make. The Indo-Pacific region is home to 60% of the world's GDP and growing. The BRI, uh, Belt and, and Road Initiative, has been very successful and the US needs to fight back by devising, joining or expanding multilateral trade agreements which exclude Beijing and draw nations away from its coercive practices. So if doubts remain around the efficacy of open trade in DC, I hope you snap out of that pronto. The second issue, frankly, here is that the effort will be uh, not just to engage Asian allies, but European allies. Now, I've done tried to do this in the past officially and elsewhere. It's high time that we began a much more consequential dialogue between Europe and Asia about Asia. Um, I don't think that's an easy dialogue. And I think, I think uh, all countries involved have different perspectives, but we need to be more purposeful about it. We've had discussions about climate change, about Afghanistan, about NATO, about the Balkans. Now we have to apply the same intensity to the Asia Pacific region, bridging those uh, different kinds of alliance relationships, I think are going to be challenging, but they're nevertheless very important. Yeah, don't forget about Europe. I know it's easy to, as our economic influence wanes, but the European Union is still with us, uh, representing a market of half a billion people. Uh, Britain and France, of course, remain nuclear states and wield a, a decent amount of soft power also. And remember, countries like Germany and, and Switzerland are admired in Asia and often serve as models of health, wealth and prosperity. So Europe will definitely have a role to play in this and any administration uh, that ignored that would be shooting itself in the foot. And then lastly guys, you know, every time China is confronted with a group of nations that are organizing against them, there's no country better in splitting those countries like a cord of wood. Look at what China has done in the G20 very effective at blocking countries that seek to take common steps against them. And so do not underestimate how challenging 
uh, this uh, uh, dialogue with allies will be. I do want to commend uh, the Trump administration on the Quad. More can be done there, but that's not the only place that we need in terms of institution building. Sure, but I would just add that you're unlikely to get a better opportunity in terms of forming coalitions than this very moment. All the polling data indicate COVID has seriously damaged China's reputation. It is at historic lows, not just in the West, but, but everywhere. So don't snatch defeat from the jaws of victory on this one. And that leads to the fourth area, institutions. I think withdrawing uh, from a number of institutions and investing modestly is not an option going forward. We will need to rejoin uh, a number of institutions, the WHO, uh, the Paris Accords, but we will have to double down on most of the engagements across Asia. And they seem like just, you know, uh, almost, you know, ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, the ARF, the East Asia Summit, they, they seem like alphabet soup of diplomatic engagements, but increasingly Asians judge the United States by our attendance record and our engagement. They're a long way away. I do want to commend uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo for a lot of engagement. We're going to have to also step up. The next administration spend much more time in these uh, building these institutions, engaging uh, uh, in difficult discussions and essentially seeking to build the capacity across the board. And this crystallizes the difference in approach that Republicans and Democrats will likely take, I think. So the World Health Organization, it's got problems. Yeah, it's corrupt, it's inefficient, it's too gullible in terms of accepting Chinese information or whatever. And Donald Trump's solution was to say, I don't need to hear crap from a bunch of hippie freaks living in denial. Screw you guys, I'm going home. But Carmen, we're trying to, uh, screw you guys, home. Whereas Campbell says, if you do that, those organizations still exist, and now the Chinese have more influence, not less. Another way of thinking about it would be, if you want to control the game, you've got to be on the pitch. And there's no use in a referee saying to two teams of footballers, here are the rules, obey them while I go for a pint, will you? No, <laughs> that <laughs> is resting too much faith in the sons of men, as I think the god of Jacob once put it. And of course, having a referee doesn't prevent cheating, but can minimize cheating and provide a mechanism for dealing with it. So that's where he's coming from. I just hope this re-engagement is conducted with a bit of backbone, because so far we've been legitimizing and therefore normalizing bad behavior. And whether Joe Biden has the sand to impose penalties when necessary, for instance, will be the ultimate test of this. And then finally, Dean, and I'll conclude in just a moment, is really China. How to think about China going forward more directly. And I do believe that the watchword of relations with China will be competition. We will try to modify it with words like stable competition, but that's not just for us to decide. And I think we have to recognize that this is a relationship unlike the former Soviet Union and people who fall back on Cold War metaphors I think the Cold War is a very poor uh, framework for thinking about the US-China, not least of which because no country wants to make a fundamental decision of which side they're on. Also, middle powers are going to play effectively in that space. But uh, countries are divided through boardrooms and through government offices, with some wanting a closer relationship with China because of obvious economic reasons and others believing that some sort of relationship with the United States and other Western institutions is essential. So that that whole dynamic is going to continue. It's, it's extremely important. And, and, and the framework for the US-China relationship is going to be multicolored, not you know, kind of uh, uh, black and white of the kind of the relationship between the United States and the former Soviet Union going forward. Okay, so the Cold War analogy is uh, unhelpful in some respect. Uh, China and the Soviet Union are very different. 
Right, for a start, Moscow was an existential threat to Washington in a way that Beijing is just not, okay? China is not trying to spread communism at the point of a nuke. But uh, crucially, China is far more stable, all right? The Soviet Union was an economic basket case that could be contained and eventually imploded. That is not going to happen to China, okay? We are going to have to find a way to coexist and people need to come to terms with that. However, there is no question that part of the CCP's strategy involves ultimately usurping the United States as world hegemon. And in that respect, the hostility towards Western values is reminiscent of the Cold War. The main difference, of course, is that the Chinese are far more likely to succeed. So again, competition will be the watchword hopefully stable, but there are almost no uh, guardrails on the US-China relations. So the potential for inadvertence in accident is real and escalation on issues in the South China Sea, across the Taiwan Strait, we do not have the mechanisms in place that would manage an increasingly complex relationship like the United States and China. I also think we tend to underestimate the nature of the interdependence between the United States and China. Um, I, I know uh, there is a view that we will be able to permanently and decisively decouple and delink. I think certain elements of decoupling will continue in technology, 5G and the like, but that process will be difficult and there will be areas where I think Chinese investment in the United States will be discouraged. I think there will likely be some elements of uh, re uh, retaliation in China. I think we need to understand clearly by taking steps against China, there will be consequences and there will be pain felt. And both countries will need to understand that moving away from interdependence will have uh, economic consequences more generally. Sure. And this is why you decouple as selectively as possible. I don't think anybody's seriously suggesting that you sever all trade with China. Uh, that would be ridiculous and uh, counterproductive. I mean, it would make conflict more likely. But you do want to ring fence certain products related to security and infrastructure, so they're built and managed by Americans or American allies. That's the first thing. And then, in terms of supply chains uh, more broadly, what a great opportunity to expand alliances in the region by gradually moving factories to Indonesia or Malaysia and investing there. But I believe that path is put in place generally. And the key will be to balance these elements of competition and hedging with what I think will be elements and areas where their members of the Biden team will desire a degree of engagement with China going forward. And I think there is a view, Dean, Dean that, that fundamentally that the existential issues confronting the United States and China, the pandemic, the tail end of the pandemic, hopefully, climate change, proliferation, that they demand a degree, not necessarily of cooperation, but alignment or coordination going forward. The interesting thing about the US-China relationship, relationship that I've worked on and with for almost 30 years, is that we have almost no habits of cooperation, almost none. So even though we work in alignment occasionally, um, the level of distrust, has always been high and uh, very little structural cooperation in the third world, in uh, development on a host of issues. And trying to do that now uh, in a period of heightened tensions will mean that it's all the more difficult. <laughs> okay, so we might be drifting onto Fantasy Island now with <laughs> cooperation. I mean, first of all, you're not gonna get cooperation on climate change so forget it. They're a developing nation, all right? They're trying to get rich, and you get rich by burning energy. It's as simple as that. If you ask them to stop and stay poor, they're going to say, no, fuck you. An answer I don't begrudge them, by the way. And on broader issues, they need to come to the table, right? The trouble with COVID 
was they covered it up and everyone paid the price, including their own people. And the West needs to get better at calling that stuff out and stop thanking the CCP every time it doesn't do something completely psychopathic, right? They don't get rewarded for being a functioning member of the international community. We're not going to say, oh, oh, good job, China. Uh, yes. Uh, on second thoughts, uh, keep the, the Spratly Islands. <laughs> you deserve them. It's like, no, just no. But finally, I will just say that the biggest issue, uh, friends, the biggest issue for the United States is to dispel uh, views uh, and concerns and hopes, frankly, in China. Uh, that are across every boardroom and every prime minister's office and uh, uh, leaders' uh, uh, close set. And that is a view that the United States is in the midst of a hurtling decline. And that the combination of a tragic performance on the pandemic, uh, uh, horrible social divisions in the United States, and as I said, Dean, at the outset, reevaluating. Re American purposes in the world suggest an America that is um, in many respects uh, uh, withdrawing from global politics. Well, you can't argue with that. America is a house divided against itself. Uh, the reasons for which are outside the scope of this video. But look, the bottom line is, unless you can come together, re-establish a broad sense of self and vision for the future, this is all completely moot, to be honest, and the CCP is loving it, by the way, especially when they see Americans undermine their own system, whether it's the Constitution is white supremacist, so repeal it, or the election was stolen, so steal it back. That's when presidency cracks open the rice wine because it allows him to say, see, this is what you get with a democratic republic. Surely a benevolent dictator is preferable to all that rubbish. But my hope is that, in fact, the United States can find the courage, the cunning, uh, the effectiveness to continue to play a leading role with our allies and partners in the Asia Pacific region going forward. The only way that we will be successful is, as your mission uh, exemplifies, that, that we do find some uh, uh, composure and commitment at the water's edge to work together as Democrats and Republicans and allies on common purpose uh, going forward. Okay, let's sum up. This strategy is clearly pragmatic and based on a couple of premises, namely Chinese political and economic influence should be limited and the current American rules-based order should be maintained. And if you're a pragmatist and buy into those premises, it's not bad, right? It represents a solid 60% of what needs to happen. I'd like to see ideas on how intellectual property will be preserved, how Russia fits in to the picture, and how you'll curb CCP influence at home, right? In terms of Hollywood and, and universities. I mean, it's just a, a cesspit. Whether Joe Biden will actually listen to this guy is anyone's guess, but based on everything, I would expect this administration to apply elements of both Obamaism and Trumpism, right? So strong emphasis on diplomacy and building relationships with partners in combination with a more tactical approach to trade and security. I suppose on a macro level, my main issue is that I'm not a pragmatist, all right? I mean, I couldn't accuse a government of genocide on Monday and invite them to tea on Tuesday. I'd be pulling embassies, political sanction, uh, the whole lot. But uh, look, that isn't going to happen. It won't happen under Biden. It didn't happen under Trump. Every successful leader is a pragmatist of some sort. 
which is why I wouldn't survive Game of Thrones, right? I'd be dead by by season one. But anyway, I think uh, that was useful in terms of getting a sense of where Sino-American relations are potentially heading over the next term. Uh, let me know what you think. Unless uh, what you think is stupid, of course, in which case keep it to yourself. Good night. Same question to you. Would you allow Chinese firms to build critical U.S. infrastructure? No, I would not. I spent more time with Xi Jinping than any world leader had by the time we left office. This is a guy who is, has, doesn't have a Democratic with a small d bone in his body. This is a guy who is a thug who, in fact, has a million Uyghurs in reconstruction camps, meaning concentration camps. This is a guy who you see what's happening right now in in. Hong Kong. And this is a guy who I was able to convince should join the international agreement at the Paris Agreement because guess what? They need to be involved. You can cooperate and you can also dictate exactly what they are. When in fact they said we're going to set up a no-fly zone, that you can't fly through our zone. He said, what do you expect me to do when I was over there? I said, we're going to fly right through it. We flew B-1 bombers through it. We've got to make it clear, they must play by the rules. Thank you, Mr. Period, President. period, period.